In this video we're going to consider how genetic variation is used in studies of population genetics. So we're going to be considering SNPs, STRs and VNTRs. So a SNP, just a reminder, is a single nucleotide polymorphism. And you have actually met this idea already because a SNP really um, is just um, a change in DNA, so a mutation. So what we do to find SNPs is we sequence whole genomes to get reference genomes, something to compare um, to. And then we take an individual with something interesting happening and we compare their genome against the reference genome. And we look for small differences. So single nucleotide polymorphism. Poly means uh, many and morphism means shape. So differences within the base sequence. And you can see in this diagram, there's just a single base change um, in the genome. Now, these mutations um, have happened in the past and they are what cause differences now. And we can then use these differences to look for correlations with diseases or other conditions and see if we can do some predicting or some preventative work. Um, so in this little image here, we've got um, some cases um, of people with a condition, maybe it's a disease, maybe they are prone to diabetes. And when we look at their genome and compare it to a reference human genome, we notice that all of these people have a single nucleotide polymorphism, a difference, a SNP, at the same place on a particular chromosome. And it happens in a high percentage of people who have this condition, disease, maybe it's diabetes. And when you compare them to a control group, in other words, a group of people without the condition, they don't have that SNP. So only 16% of those people have that part of their DNA that looks like that. So that means we can then screen people or check or raise awareness. Um, it does not, however, necessarily mean that we understand why it is the way it is. So when we do this, it's called a genome-wide association study. So we look across the whole genome and we see if we've got correlations or associations between two different things. Sometimes it's obvious because the SNP occurs in a gene and it obviously causes an amino acid change in a protein, but sometimes we don't understand why the association is there yet. We will work on that as you scientists graduate. Now, the other type of difference that we can have in our genome is repetitive DNA and differences in repetitive DNA repeat number. So let's have a look at what repetitive DNA is. So in this graphic here, we're looking at the whole human genome and we can split that into two groups. The blue arm down here is the mitochondrial genome and we're not considering that at the moment. We're thinking about the nuclear genome. So if we think about all of the genes in the nuclear genome, we think of all the DNA in there, so 3,300 megabases um, of DNA, um, about a quarter of that is to do with coding, although only 10% of that is actually to do with making a protein, um, the actual coding bit. The rest is regulatory DNA or non-coding DNA. Um, we're not interested in that when we're thinking about repetitive DNA. What we're actually going to do is come down this arm of all the stuff that is not to do with genes, not about the regulation of the genes, it's just there. And 40% of all of that non-gene related DNA is very highly repetitive. Now we can exploit that in looking at population studies. So let's have a look at how we do that. So we have two different types of repetitive DNA, repetitive DNA that occurs in big chunks and repetitive DNA that occurs in small chunks. And a lot of this information is actually unnecessary for you to remember because the principle for both is the same. So really the difference that we're looking at here in terms of classifying them and calling them something is how many base pairs are involved in the repeat size. So if it's big, it might have hundreds of base pairs in the repeat size 
and that would be called a VNTR. So each repeat chunk, so there are four chunks on this graphic here, has hundreds of base pairs. Okay. Or the number of repeats, the base pairs in the repeats could be tiny. It could be just two base pairs. So it could just go AG, 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 maybe up to 20 times. Or it could have six base pairs and just go A, T, C, G, T, C, or repeat it over and over. Okay, so if it were short, it would be called a short tandem repeat. So STRs are short repeating sections and VNTRs are big repeating sections. But for us and the applications that we, we need to know for our exam, the fact that we have repeating sections of DNA is what is important. So let's have a look at how we use them. Oh, first of all, how we visualize them. So if we have a piece of repetitive DNA, sometimes repeated twice, sometimes repeated three times, sometimes repeated four times, if we cut that piece of DNA out of the genome and pop it onto a DNA gel electrophoresis, we can separate them according to size. So you can see here that with only a couple of repeats in section A, the size of the piece of DNA that's going to be cut between these two enzymes here is going to be that long. It's the shortest of all of them, so it travels the furthest on the gel, and that is why A goes down here. At the other end, we have four repeats, so our piece of DNA cut out of the genome will be longer. Because it is longer, it will travel slower through the gel and therefore not travel as far. So band C would be here. So using gel electrophoresis, we can easily separate differences between one person and the next if they have different numbers of repeats. And because these appear on our chromosomes and we get our chromosomes from our parents, we can look at inherited patterns and we can work out who is related to whom and do all sorts of analysis and draw conclusions and do other sorts of investigative work. So let's have a look at what kinds of investigative work we can do. One of the things we can do is look at paternity. Now in real life, um, this kind of analysis looks like this image on the left. This is looking at lots of different repeating sequences. It's looking at a mum and a dad well, a dad and a mum up here, and all of their children, and looking at all of their DNA across many different repeating units. So it's quite a, an information-filled piece of gel. Um, in a, an exam question, you usually get a simplified version of this. So in the image on the right, we've just looked at four different repeating blocks. We've got a black block, we've got a purple block, we've got a green set of repeats, and we've got a yellow set of repeats. So with four pieces of information here, we are able to see that the child gets its DNA either from mum or from dad. Because of course, that's how we get our chromosomes. We get one from mum and one from dad. And you can see that that pattern is true all the way down. One chromosome from dad, one chromosome from mum. And in this case, this line is actually representing two chromosomes. One has come from mum, one has come from dad. They just happen to be the same size. So we can use DNA and the repeats in the DNA to work out to whom somebody is related. So other applications, criminal investigations, identification after mass, mass disasters, archaeology, so maybe looking at old scrolls that are on animal parchment and matching them up using DNA evidence, and conservation, looking at which animals to decide to breed with which groups, or tracing um, illegally uh, poached parts of animals, so all sorts of applications we can use this for. But there are limitations because obviously contamination would be a huge issue. Transfer of the DNA 
to one place, great, we can identify where it came from, but if you move on to a second place, it will contaminate the scene, make, making any kind of prosecution or identification really difficult. And the other thing is mutations. It is possible that um, between taking mum's DNA and then the child's DNA, we actually can get an increase or a decrease in the number of repeats. So here is an image of DNA polymerase, tracking along the DNA and trying to um, replicate it. There's the DNA polymerase, but it stutters. So it gets to a point and it slides backwards. And instead of starting off with three repeats, we've ended up with six. And the other thing we can do is lose repeats. And the way that happens is the DNA polymerase um, gets kind of caught up in a loop and the loop gets left out. So instead of starting off with lots of repeats, you end up with fewer repeats. So mutations can happen between mum and child. So there are some limitations. These things are all good for us when we're writing a response because we can link a biological understanding to the innovation and the technology. We can link the technology to a whole different variety of applications. We can then analyze data and make conclusions, and then we can look at how sound those conclusions are because we can bring in discussion of limitations. So keep your eye out for these types of questions because they are a great way to show in-depth knowledge and bring in many areas of discussion.